welcome to Taste of the Main Line with Alice Daggett. Hi, I'm Alice. This is a monthly show that shines a spotlight on the top area restaurants that every March lend their considerable talent and superb cuisine to the annual Taste of the Main Line, which benefits the Emergency Aid of Pennsylvania Foundation. The Emergency Aid is an outstanding volunteer organization located right here in Wayne that improves the lives of local women, children, and families through its extremely effective scholarships, mentoring, and grants. The restaurants that host Taste of the Main Line in March are the area's most respected. So today I'm enormously pleased to have with me Justin Weathers, one of the two geniuses behind the, the Bercy. The Bercy is the very fine French brasserie in Ardmore that opened with a bang only a year ago, but in that time has developed an impeccable reputation. So let's welcome Justin Weathers to the show. Alice, thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Thank you for being in Ardmore. Thank you for joining the main line. No, I love it. Why don't you tell us something about your restaurant, the Bercy? Well, the Bercy, uh, as you said, it's been open for about a year and a half. Uh, French brasserie, but we consider ourselves kind of a, a global cuisine of sorts. Uh, we do love the, the punishment and suffering that comes along with French cuisine. It's a, truly a uh, a lost art of and takes the time and, and the energy to produce beautiful sauces and and mm -hmm. yet still keep the food simple and approachable uh, but we love being there and we love our guests uh, we have a great bar we make everything from scratch we have wood-fired ovens and rotisseries and uh, just a lot of fun elements for us to bring to the guests so we enjoy that I, meant, I wanted to ask you about the history of the Bercy. What, what, what brought you he here? Well, we were shown the, the property was Primavera Pizza Kitchen for a long time. Uh, and, of course, it was the old, it was a bank for you know, over, uh, for about 100 years. So the, the facade and the build and the layout of that, when we were shown the real estate, you know, in your mind, it's this grand room with a, is it a steakhouse? Is it, and we thought that that space needed energy to it. And energy to me is, is a, a brasserie, uh, kind of a buzzing, moving, uh, active, open kitchen kind of environment where everyone can kind of participate. A little dinner theater. Hmm. <laughs> With the kitchen being the theater. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I have certainly eaten there many times. I love what you do. Um, I particularly love your breads. Oh, yes. Our, our breads are all baked in-house. Um, that's another labor of love, you know, <laughs> keeping the starter and the sourdough. And, uh, but we you know, use everything by hand. I th think... You could tell a lot by a bread program at any restaurant, and for ours, it's it's something that we are there at three o'clock every morning, getting done, um, getting it started. So, and you should be very proud of it. It's superb. Yeah, I love it. Uh, there's there are all kinds of visual impacts when you walk in. It's a gorgeous space, and and of course the oven, the brick oven, is very very prominent, and so is your oyster bar. Oh, yeah. Your raw bar. It's not just oysters. Well, we, we pride ourselves. I'm a huge oyster fan myself. If I go into a place and I know that there are fresh oysters available, um, I'm, I'm going out. You're in, a, in for them. And, and I just think, you know, that, that freshness, that look, that, you know, that fresh from the ocean, uh, you know, there's mm -hmm. no manipulating that. So, you know, as good as your cocktail and your menu are, you know, it just starts with that, uh, that, raw, that raw element. It's a brave man, the first who tried the oyster. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> or the lobster. Or the lobster, yeah. <laughs> well, tell me what other menu items you're really proud of. You no, know, we, we love our classics, um, which is the beef bourguignon with our braised short rib and house-made pappardelle pasta. Uh, we love our, our roasted chicken that we cook on the rotisserie. Um, we love our trout almondine. Um, which is just, it's so great in its simplicity. Just Pocono trout, pan seared, toasted almonds, lemon brown butter sauce, and haricot vert. It's those simple dishes where you're like, you know, it's actually, it's easy to mess them up. 
you know, so the <laughs> handling of that process and that simplicity of those dishes, you, that's what people keeps people coming back for more. So your sourcing must be very important to you. Sourcing is absolutely important. Um, where you choose to get those from, the farmers, uh, the fishermen, your purveyors on a, on a daily basis, those interactions are extremely important. Um, you know, the days of like walking through a market and picking things out, you know, aren't exactly you know, in that way. But what we try to do is make sure that our relationships with the vendors, that we're getting the best that they have to offer and then putting it on the table. So they're pretty much local. Oh, as local as we can get. Uh huh. You know, um, you know Pennsylvania avocados are, are not the best. So you know there are certain <laughs> things you have to go out of state for. You took me by surprise. <laughs> you said Pennsylvania avocados. Yeah, they're not the best. So so of course you have to you know and you we want to see that. Um, and we also celebrate you know, everything that comes from across the pond. So whether it's great French cheeses or vinegars or wine, uh, we also want to kind of highlight those for, for what they are. Oh, your wine program. That's yes. something to talk about. Well, the wine program um, is really based on French and then its American counterparts. So we like to see interpretations of Bordeaux that's done in California or even New York, uh, upstate. Um, so you know, it's we have a nice by the glass program, which really covers kind of all the different tastes that you could want to, and then uh, a bottle program for the more adventurous. <laughs> I don't know whether it, any it's it's not adventurous to, to choose a wine at, at diversity. It's you know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty safe. Yeah. It's going to be delicious. Well, we you know, and the staff there is really works hard on on that. We're constantly training them and working with them on developing that. And I want to bring things in that are interesting and stay uh, on trend. Whether that's natural wines or biodynamic wines or you know, something that's from a new region. Um, like even Pennsylvania wines are, are very popular right now. Yeah, they're they're uh, coming into their own. I, I yeah, understand. Absolutely. Yeah. You 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 said bio. What did you say bio? Biodynamic. Yes. What is that? So biodynamic farming is just it's a more natural. You let the vines grow kind of a little wilder. Uh, there's no irrigation. It's uh, there's a little hocus pocus voodoo magic behind it as well. <laughs> um, you know, but it's to try to get the the more natural kind of like a throwback style to winemaking. That's really and what interesting. Are, what regions are doing that in Pennsylvania and, and other places? Yeah, in this I mean, um, you know, the southwest of France is very popular for doing that. The Rhone oh. Valley is very popular for doing oh, that okay. as well. Um, well, I do love Bordeaux and I do love Rhones. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Cote de Rhones. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the trout amandine. Uh, we were very lucky last week to be in the, in your kitchen watching your partner, co-owner, chef. Yeah, Chef Joe Monick. Yeah. Tell us Hard, about hardest him. Hardest working man in the business. <laughs> uh, Chef Joe Monty, he's got a fantastic resume. He's worked with Jean George and Susanna Fu and... Uh, he was the executive chef at Park Restaurant and the Dandelion. Uh, he's worked with Morimoto. So he has a wide breadth of it. But you know, his real key is his leadership. Uh, you know, your program and, and the mentoring that you do. We see in the restaurant business uh, more than probably any other business where that the young kids come in and you know, you're mentoring them. Sometimes it's their first job that they've ever had. Um, you know, and we've seen... Uh, employees go from dishwashers when they're 16 years old to executive chef level. Mm -hmm. So that mentoring and growth that we see in the restaurant business and, and what you do with your program is just so important. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the mentorship that happens in the world today is coming from YouTube and, and, and you know, phones and, you know, and, and things. So any way that we can present ourselves as being mentors, either professionally or, or, or in any growth model, uh, I think is as good as it gets. Well, I, I hope I hope we'll have time to talk more about that. Yeah. But I'm very curious to see the uh, the tape that we did, that we took last week when we were visiting uh, Joe. So. Oh yeah, well this is a great dish to pick up in your home. Uh, you know, minimal ingredients, but if you watch Chef's technique on it, I think you'll learn a few things. Well, let's see if we can learn something now. So for trout almondine, uh, here we use a about a six to eight ounce filet of uh, uh, Pocono uh, farm-raised trout. Um, it's a rainbow trout. 
Um, we get it from a local purveyor here in Philadelphia, um, but you can get it at any supermarket. They carry it. Sometimes they have whole fish, which are a little bit smaller uh, head on, but they're generally all boneless. And even if there's little bones in the trout, um, a lot of them dissolve with cooking. It's not like a bigger fish or a uh, saltwater fish where the bones are uh, bigger and sturdier and are a choking hazard. These are super small, they're pin bones. They're about the size of a fine hair. Um, so really they're more digestible than a regular one, but uh, this one is completely V-cut, all the bones out. Um, this is about a seven ounce filet, rainbow trout. So. To cook the trout, um, the things I like to do is first is just simply season it with uh, kosher salt, a little bit of uh, ground black pepper on both sides. Um, really I watch my seasoning when I, I cook any fish. Now trout is a freshwater fish so it doesn't have a lot of natural salinity, but specifically like uh, saltwater fish, uh, they do. So really salt is... Uh, permeates the fish a lot more than say a piece of meat. Uh, red beef, you do a lot more salt versus fish. You want to keep it pretty light. Um, so when I cook trout or cook any fish or anything, I like to use cast iron pans. Um, cast iron, uh, it heats a lot better. Um, it uh, quickly heats, it cools down quickly. Um, it, it is completely non-stick. A lot of stainless steel pans will stick a lot easier than these cast irons. And with time, they become more non-stick because of the oil that you use and keeping it well seasoned with oil. Um, generally, when I use these pans, I wipe them out. I don't take them and put them in soapy water and scrub them out. That actually ruins the coat. You really just wipe them out and then I clean them daily by daily with oil and salt to get them nice. So now we have the pan, it's smoking. I'm gonna go skin side down in the pan. Now, if you take a look, it's already moving around, that's great. I turned on the heat, it went from high to medium heat, and I'm gonna let the process of getting the skin uh, golden brown and delicious start right now. And really, I'm gonna just cook it on direct heat for about 45 seconds before I put it in the oven. Um, I'll finish it in the oven. Um, that way it just equally cooks um, instead of just cooking all on the stovetop. I feel if you go on the stovetop, which is fine, um, then you're not gonna have as evenly cooking. One side will be more cooked than the other. Could be, um, might get burnt, it might get uh, be a little more bitter. Um, so now at this point, I think this is a good opportunity. I go right into a 400 degree oven. So at this point when I cook, I'm gonna cook the hair caver. Um, that's gonna be the garnish on the plate. I have burr fondue, which is pre-made. Uh, I pre-make in the restaurant just because I go through so much. But essentially it is a little bit of vegetable stock and butter um, and cream. I reduce the vegetable stock. Um, I add heavy cream and then I use a immersion blender and I emulsify butter into it. And you get this real creamy um, glaze, which I'm gonna heat the green beans in. Uh, the Hercover beans is a French bean. It's a slender bean. Um, it's not like the green bean that like uh, my, my parents used to grow growing up. Um, it's a lot thinner, it's, it's delicate, um, it's less fibrous. Um, uh, great flavor. So we're glazing it and I'm just seasoning it with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now the green beans I did blanch ahead of time uh, in boiling water, just like any green vegetable, salted boiling water, cook it for about 20 seconds, then I shock it in an ice bath. You can go from raw cooking it in the burr fondue. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but I generally like my beans and a lot of my green vegetables to be a little more tender. Um, some people like them crunchy. I, I like them tender. I think it's more palatable. I think it brings out more flavor in the bean. Um, and you know, it, it's just that super crunch raw bean flavor. I just don't think it is nice as a fully cooked uh, bean. So that's it. They're nice and glazed. They, they look good. Um, they're seasoned well. And then we're gonna keep it off to the side for the plating of our dish.
and they'll, they'll hold just well. So, essentially how I build the sauce for the almondine, which is a brown butter almond sauce, I, uh, I build the sauce right in the pan that I cook the fish in. Um, we're going to add butter to the fish. Um, that butter is going to brown, it's going to pick up the flavor of the fish. And then when the fish is done cooking, I'll take it out, I'll put it on the plate, and then I'll finish the sauce. The sauce is a quick sauce, so you want to have all your mise en place uh, in place. So I have over here, I have some slivered almonds. I have lemon juice, I have a squeeze bottle. Um, you can use just whole lemons that are just halved in your home. Um, I have some cubed unsalted butter. Um, I have uh, my salt and then I use a little bit of just finely chiffonade parsley um, to finish it with. Um, a lot of people think parsley is for garnishing and making things pretty. It's for, to me, it's a flavor profile. Um, I think parsley has a really good, fresh, refreshing flavor. Um, it's more than just something that makes a plate look prettier. So, I would say right now the fish is 50% cooked. The top of the fish is starting to go opaque. You can still tell it's still a little undercooked, and that's perfect. I'm gonna add butter, generous amount of butter, because it's a brown butter sauce. Now, what's browning in the pan is the milk solids. Um, there's fat and milk solids in butter. When the butter melts and the milk solids go above a certain smoking point for butter, the milk solids convert from milk solids to brown uh, milk solids. So essentially, all of that dairy is, is, is browning out of it. And it starts foaming and get buttery. You can kind of see that it is brown. I'm gonna flip the fish, turn down the heat, and then you can tell that the skin of the fish is nice, golden brown. I just use a little bit of that butter to base the top of the fish, just to ensure that it's crispy and well cooked. Now I have the heat right now on medium-low and I'm going to go ahead and plate the green beans, the hair caver. I like to put them right in the middle of the plate. They're nicely glazed, beautiful. Fish cooks really fast. It's not like a piece of meat. So. At this point, the fish is perfectly cooked. I take a spatula and I bring it and I place it over the beans. Now, at this point, all that brown butter, I'm gonna add my almonds to the butter and I'm gonna toast them. I'm just gonna add a little knob of butter just to get it, uh, Activated here. Keep it going. It's still browning. It looks really good. Now I season this butter with a little bit of salt. And then basically to stop the cooking process and the browning, you add you add lemon juice. The lemon juice will literally just completely stop it. And that's now. I finish with the parsley and then now I take my spoon my spoon the almonds over top not too much butter good amount of almonds and that is how you make perfect trout almondine here at the Bercy.
Well, that was wonderful. Justin, that was fabulous. You're very lucky to have Chef Joe as your partner. Yeah, just to let you know, ladies, he's married. So. <laughs> I loved, he seems very skilled. I loved what he showed us, but I also loved everything that he had to say. It was very informative. It, well, you know, an important part about being a chef, which is the French word for for chief, really, is is teaching it. You know, I, I think there's a misconception when people see chefs that they're the ones cooking your food, but really they're leading the orchestra. So that informative step-by-step -step process and, and teaching uh, someone how to pick up a trout almondine is super important because in the long run it's consistency that matters the most. Uh, okay. And that consistency and that if that trout's your favorite dish, well, you better be able to come back in three weeks and have the same trout. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Everyone, everyone being, uh, being challenged to be the best that they can be and to be that same person day after day putting out the same, the same caliber. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, uh, food consistency, coaching, mentoring, working with, with the team. Um, there's so many different layers of, of running a good restaurant, and you know, that's one of the things that keeps my hair going gray, but also uh, <laughs> keeps life exciting. Well, you know, uh, this show is talking about two things, you and your peers on the main line, the best of the restaurants, and it's also talking about Taste of the Main Line, yes. which is that fabulous event in March every year that is only the, the, the creme de la creme, the best of the restaurants. Um, why do you like doing Taste of the Main Line? I love Taste of the Main Line because I think it's, it's an update for everyone who lives out on the Main Line or, or who dines on the Main Line to see what's new, what are folks doing. Uh, for us in the business, it's also a kind of a look to see who's working <laughs> where and, and what they're putting out. And who's because, doing what, yeah. Because it's the time to show off. Um, uh, and we're gonna, we've got some tricks up our sleeves for this one because at the same time, you, know, you want people to leave them. Say, hey, this is the best. For thing sure, <laughs> for, for sure. You're, primarily, you're there to show the, 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 the guests, the hundreds of guests who attend. Yeah, absolutely. That you are the restaurant that they need to visit next. Well, yeah, you know, but, but, I know, but I know you're kind of peeking over and seeing. You, you have and to. And you're probably, maybe not you, but others are getting ideas from you. Well, <laughs> and you may be getting some ideas from other people well, as well. Yeah, it's <laughs> we, it's uh, this business that we're in, the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. We see employees that we've worked for before yes. and chefs that you yes. work for and chefs at other events and so it's it's always nice to kind of come together uh almost in the same kind of energy and space and, and get to do our thing together i know that's true i've been told that by the restaurateurs that do the event that that you all are a fraternity Oh, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I've been told it's like a fraternity party, but not in the bad sense of the word. <laughs> <laughs> but that it, but that uh, that you all love having the opportunity to just hang out together, because the rest of your life you're just turning out food and working really, really hard. Well, well we're all in the business together, mm -hmm. so we understand the struggles of uh, balancing family life and work life and you know, all that time, which is. You know, it's, so it's nice to kind of rub elbows with your peers. Well, that's what I've been told. And, and Taste of the Main Line benefits the Emergency Aid of Pennsylvania Foundation, which, which does two things. It gives grants to small nonprofits in the area that might fall through the cracks of the bigger uh, uh, foundations. And it focuses on, on the nonprofits that serve families women, children getting women back in the workforce, children getting educated. We really, we really um, promote education. And on that line, the second thing we do is give scholarships that come equipped with seven years of mentoring, which is am amazing. Three years through high school and four years through college. And we mentor other students as well, not just the ones that get scholarships. So how does that fit into your philosophy of life? Well, my philosophy, I, I actually grew up in a, in a multitude of foster homes myself. Um, so that mentorship was either extremely absent at times or there was something that I greatly latched on to. And uh, just having people, having someone that you can respond to and work to uh, in these days is incredibly important. Bounce ideas off uh, because if left you know, up to the own, you know, 
the, the mind of what I wanted to be when I was a 17, 18 year old and then the reality of where I'm at now in my life, uh, you know, you, you want that feedback. Yeah. You know, of course you're going to walk through life and make your own mistakes, but a little direction sometimes is fantastic. There was a mentor that got me to go to culinary school actually into my later 20s that was a life transformation. It was a transformation. And that idea of, you know, maybe this is an avenue that I could go and pursue and find passion and, and excitement for. So, so I deeply believe in, in the cause of that and, and have it. And we need to coach these young folks out there. The world is changing. Well, I have two daughters myself, two and four, uh, Scarlett and Marianne. And I have to think about their future because in reality, the future that we see in 10, 15 years, are we really going to know even what's going to be mm -hmm. like? You know, think of like mm -hmm. since the last 10, 15 years, how it's probably been the, the greatest time of change in the history of the world. Um, will food be the same? You know, that's something that we bring up a lot you know, with uh, laws changing and food style and, and job. Um, you know, will the idea of service leave while everything be computerized oh. and digitized. Uh, oh there's dear. something that you oh have to dear. always keep on there. <laughs> uh, hopefully I didn't get too deep on you there. <laughs> so, no, no. But uh but us mentoring us like uh you know connecting uh previous experiences with with young minds it's the best thing you could do. That's so wonderful to hear. Uh, we, we at the Emergency Aid have always felt so strongly about mentoring, and you, you surprised me when you mentioned that it, you were well into your 20s when a mentor suggested culinary school, which many people who go into food have, have had that attraction all their lives. In fact, Chef Joe mentioned to us that he had always had that attraction. Um, but I know that with mentoring, it can be very, it can be very intense, or it can be just such, a, for instance, it can be so um, just giving the impression that you care about someone. A mentor, a child is going to respond to someone who seems to care about them. Yes. And, and if, if, you know, if someone's watching me, I might do better in school. If someone cares about how, not watching me, but someone cares about how I do in school, I'm going to do a little bit better in school than if I'm just, you know, floating in the wind myself. So, uh, well, I also think, you know, I think of myself professionally and other folks in our industry professionally where, uh, you know, you have people who have been in the industry or have been in life. Uh, that mentoring shouldn't stop when you're a kid as well. I look for mentors now. Uh, I think we all should, especially in our fields or in our practice and what we do. That idea that I can bounce ideas yeah. off someone. Otherwise, I'm just assuming that I have all the answers. <laughs> you know, and the restaurant business has taught me a lot. You know, this the Bercy is our third restaurant. We're opening our fourth in Fraser Stove and Tap, um, and getting to know areas, getting to see ideas as they come on. You know, an idea that you create is never perfect. Like the Bercy that we created a year and a half ago is not the same Bercy. Um, now that it is, and we're continuing to evolve and to move into it. We have it with Joe moving on to our new growth. We have a very exciting announcement coming for a new chef team that is going to take a, a. While we have our classics, we're going to really have to modernize and and keep uh, evolving and changing uh, to stay fresh. Well, that's that's what we all have to do in our lives. Yeah. But it, but as you mentioned, it's probably even more fast moving in the food industry. That in the tech industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Justin, very, very much. This has been a delightful uh, conversation. I certainly have learned a lot. I hope that our audience has as well. Join us each month as we take a look at what goes on behind the scenes at these fantastic restaurants and get to know their creative chefs and owners. Next month, we will visit with Savona, and its chef owner, Andrew Massangelo. Please join us then, and also join us in person to enjoy their delicious specialties at the Taste of the Mind line on Thursday, March 12th. For more information or to get tickets, go to tasteofthemainline.com. I hope we'll see you there. So until next time, bon appetit.